to minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Hi, this is James Alvis, and I'm going to be doing the second part of the uh, two-part talk of, I hope it's two parts, of the uh, the idea of uh, the condensed life. Life is uh, much shorter than we think it is, extremely short life. Uh, we think of life as, you know, long. We think of somebody who's 80 years old, has lived a long life, and in a way he has. He's lived a lot longer than somebody who's been 20 or 25. But he's, uh, in another way, he hasn't. He hasn't lived a long life at all. Um, and I actually think uh, as you get older, um, the years go by quicker. This is actually scientifically proven that it seems that they go by faster than they are uh, going by. Um, as you get older, the brain processes time differently and time moves faster, which is unfortunate if you're uh, getting older because uh, it means that time is uh, really moving along once you get um, up there and you have less of it to uh, for that to be happening so it's if it's one of those bombs in a movie where you know you remove the wrong wire and all of a sudden it starts counting faster and you're like oh no the bomb is coming the bomb is death so it's uh, pretty much um, as bad as it gets as far as uh, personal um, happiness is concerned um, at least on this side of the um, uh, divide anyway um, I remember the guy's name that I was talking about last time his name was Steve Coet he's an excellent poet fantastic poet you know, I've loved this work for many, many years. Um, so it's pretty disappointing. I forgot his name in the middle of the talk. But he's a, uh, you know, I want to read you this poem. And the reason I wanted to read this poem is it, it, it dovetails into um, the ideas we're talking about. So let me read it. Um, I don't have permission to read it, but I hope, uh, you know, if any of Steve Coates, uh people come across it, please forgive me. I just love the poem. And I think it helps the, um, the conversation. It's called Lurid Confessions. One fine morning, they move in for the pinch and snap on the cuffs, just like that. Turns out they've known about you for years. Have a file the length of a paddy wagon and everything else, tapes, prints, film, the whole schmear. Don't ask me how, but they've managed to plug into your mic, uh, a mic into one of your molars and know every felonious move and transgression back from the very beginning with chromes and to, of your least indiscretion and peccadillo. Needless to say, you are thrilled. Though sitting in the, there in a the docket, you bogart it, tough as an old tooth. Your jaw set, your sleeves rolled in three days of stubble. Only, when they play it back, it looks different. A life common and loathsome as gum stuck to a chair. Tedious hours of you picking your nose, scratching, eating, clipping your toenails. Alone, you look stupid. In public, you wrap your wit, slimy and limp as an old band-aid. They have thousands of pictures of people around you stifling yawns as for sex a bit of pathetic roping among the unlovely and luckless a dance with everyone making steamy love in the dark and you alone in the corner eating the pretzel you leap to your feet protesting that's not how it was they have it all wrong but nobody hears you the bailiff is snoring the judge is cleaning his teeth the jurors are all wearing eyeglasses with eyes painted open the flies have folded their wings and stopped buzzing. In the end, after huge doses of coffee, the jury is polled. One after another, they manage to rise to their feet like narcoleptics in August, sealing your fate. Innocent, 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 right down the line, you are carried out screaming. <laughs> God, I love that poem. It's just an awesome poem. And... The reason I wanted to share it and um, get through that word ectochromic, I just completely butchered it. But the reason I wanted to, to read that poem is because that's life as we really, there is so much in our lives that it's just empty space. It's just, it's just, it, it's limp as an old band-aid, as he says. And we think that we're living these extraordinary lives, or if, you know, most of us do anyway. We don't think of our lives as dull and boring because we're living them. But if other people were watching them, they'd see me typing at my computer for hours at a time, you know, and then going to the bathroom and, and making a, you know, a pasta dinner. It's just not really all that expensive, uh, uh, interesting at all. You know, if, even the, you know, it's one of the reasons I never really liked reality television, when it follows people around doing something that's banal. 
you know, keeping up with the Kardashians or something like that. Not that I've ever watched that show. But I imagine that it's, it's just watching these famous people do stupid stuff. Doing stuff that normal people do, and it's just the only thing reason it's interesting is because they're not, they're famous. That's it. Um, and they're rich, and so they can go to different shops and boutiques and things like that. But it's not, it's, it, otherwise, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a better setting maybe than my life. But it's not really all that more, much more interesting, and my life isn't that interesting. And so, you know, and when you compress all the interesting stuff together, because there are interesting things that happen to people. Even I suppose the Kardashians, there are interesting pe things that happen to them. But when, it, but when we come to these moments, we remember these moments, and they're big moments in our lives. But all the other stuff, the detritus and the flotsam and jetsam of of our days, just kind of just flows away and moves out away from um, our memories, like waves almost. Just and they, the ripples get smaller and smaller and smaller. And the smaller the ripple was to begin with, the smaller the wave was to begin with, the sooner it dies out, out in the member, memory and becomes just flat, everlasting water that stretches out to the horizon. And if we look hard enough, maybe we can see some of that, but not a lot of it. Oh, well, remember the tsunamis, remember the big crashing kahuna waves where you're just, you know, you're riding and surfing the big deal, but you're not. This is the paddling around in the in the kiddie pool. No, it's, that's not it's not much is happening there. Um, and so we come to this ultimate understanding that a life, no matter how long it is, is a very short thing. And when we look back on it, it's even shorter. Most of our life is taken up by stuff that is not in any way memorable or interesting and the stuff that we do that is interesting even that fades even the biggest waves in time fade and become just kind of bumps that we remember god how i love my first wife and it's very hard to remember much of that marriage that went on for two years and it was a very eventful marriage a lot of stuff happened there i mean we 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 moved from uh you know i met her in uh Fort Sheridan, Illinois. We fell in love, at least I did, and we um, we went to uh, you know I took her from there, and I went to, we went to Florida, and we had a very tumultuous courtship where we were living together, um, and I thought I was losing her. She was working at a diner, and she was kind of started to see other guys, and I said, well, this is horrible. Maybe if I marry her, and so I married her. Um, and then I thought, well, we have to get out of here because they're, you know, I kept moving her, hoping that, you know, the next place would, would, would stop her from, you know, looking at other guys and considering other guys. And we went to Michigan and I worked multiple jobs to, to do that. And it just did, it didn't, um, you know, and then while I was doing that, she was doing other things. I was trying to pay her traffic tickets that I didn't know about when I, when I was there and, and all, you know, I worked horrible jobs that were horrendous on me they were brutal i still have back pain from one of them and ultimately we got you know i lost everything literally everything i you know i worked for up to that point in my life and i was busted and i had to call my parents and ask them for them to get gas money so i could try to make it home in my bus my car that was breaking down and um I, you know, they sent me the hundred dollars. I put gas in it, I, and I told her, "Listen, I'm leaving. You can, you can go with me, or you can stay here." She decided to go with me, so she went. We went back to Florida on a basically, you know, fifty bucks in a prayer, and you know, and then from in Florida, it got even worse. Uh, I don't want to go through it all here, but the uh, the whole that whole I just gave you all the events on it, or at least most of them, and even still. You're talking about two years, two years in which I was able to summarize them, basically almost all the um, primary events in a couple of minutes. And there was so much that happened there. It was a day after day of daily things. I could tell you what the weather, uh, you know, what it felt like the dew on my face in the Michigan morning when I would get up early at six, having gone to bed at two, uh, to go to work at the at the um, at the factory or at the uh, 
you know, at the time was that it was lifting lumber at a Home Depot. Um, that was my other job. So I was probably going to the, the Home Depot, and it would just, and, and what it would be like to be warming up the car, and then to put in the Springsteen tape, and all the, and the, and the drive there, and hoping that the car would make it, <laughs> and you know, and just t turning and trying to make, trying to make the, the the shortest trip possible, so that I would use the least amount of gas and the least amount of maintenance on the car, and wear and tear on the car, just to just to survive. Um, and each one of those, I, I keep a lot of that because I keep it in my in my head, a lot of that. Uh, so I've lived a longer life than some people because I've been able to, 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 to collect a lot of these moments that a lot of people just let go. But even still, I recognize that my life is extremely short. It's extremely short. Um, and as I, you know, as I'm coming up on 50, I realize that, wow, there's just life... Life goes. It goes very quickly, and and most of it isn't much. Most of it isn't much. Um, I was reading a William Saroyan novel as I was doing these couple of talks, and maybe I'll close with this. And it was a, about um, it's a, you know it's called Boys and Girls Together. It's a novel. And it was the first time I read it. I've been saving a couple of Sororian. I've read most of Sororian stuff, but I've read, you know, I have a couple of things I haven't. This was one of them. And so I was reading this, and I was, and I want to read it to you because I just think, you know, ultimately you come to this place in your life, and I think I'm at it now, where this this sounds, and it doesn't, it doesn't exactly tie into the condensed nature of life, but it does speak to a certain. Um, a certain truth about what you come to eventually in life. Let me read it. It's just a quote from, uh, I guess it's, you know, it's uh, later in the book, chapter 28 in the book. Um, the burden was home again. The anxiety was back. The tenseness, the deep troubling, all the things that nagged. He was failing, that's all. He was no longer tireless, that's all. He was getting along and the gimp was in him forever now to let him know. His carcass was fat now, his gut swollen, his neck thick. He was a bigger load than he ought to ask himself to carry, but he just couldn't get things back to form, back to the good old limits, back to resistance, ease, and speed. He was slowed down, overloaded, and wearing out. His face was puffy from eating more than he needed. Yet, yet if he didn't eat so much, he couldn't carry the load at all. Well, he thought... There it is, that's all, old and fat and slow at a time when a man ought to be stepping out into his best vigor. Old, fat, slow and foolish, that's fine. The thing to do is sleep, sleep on it, sleep around it, sleep through the day because the night got away. Sleep not to catch up, not to get back to sleep, uh, not to get back to sleep at night and work at the day, not to get the order straight, but to forget for a few hours. To rest enough for a few hours in order not to fall into abject stupor. Sleep not to be restored and refreshed and sent back to work, but to die a while. Sleep to die a little more, to let dying move a little deeper, to add another layer to the fat, to make the slowest, slowness slower still, to push away a little farther the zest and decent resignation of the worker alive in a mournful world at daybreak going to his work, sleep to escape life, to embrace death. And I think that's a little bit what I've been talking about here. I think that ultimately, even though life is condensed, all the, all the small stuff weighs on a man. All the nights sleeping and the, and the petty arguments and the, and the tireless... Uh, need for maintenance of this and that and uh, it doesn't seem like life is very much but most of what it is is that space but that space itself carries a weight it carries a weight within you and I think a lot of people who kill themselves or get really depressed and they don't know why I think it's because that space isn't very good they have a lot of bad space. I don't have a lot of bad space anymore. My space is pretty good. Even the times where I'm not overly happy or not doing anything exciting, I look at my life and I say, 
that's good space. It's, I'm not going to remember it. It's not going to be the best thing that you know ever happened to anybody. It may not amount to a poem. It may not amount to a story. It may not amount to anything. I may just be sitting here looking at the sunrise and I may not remember it tomorrow, but it's good space. And I think that's what you have to have out of your life. It's not these big moments. The big moments, they're rare. And it's going to make your life seem, and if you go chasing after them, it's going to make your life seem not bigger, but smaller. Because you'll be not making the best of the space. It's the space that's your life, ultimately. Just like it's the space in the coin that's the coin. Most of the coin is the space. And if you want to be happy in life, you want to be thrilled at the end of it, how it turned out, as best you can be, even though it's short, even though it's incredibly, ridiculously short, even for people with the longest lives, fill up that space with good. Make this. Don't use sleep as a way of dying more. Fill up that space in your life with as much joy and happiness and kindness and beauty as possible. Use that space. It doesn't even matter if it's memorable. It doesn't matter if you make great leaps during that time. It doesn't even ma matter if you remember it or if anybody remembers it. Because in the end, that space, that's your life. And if it's bad, it doesn't matter what the great moments are like. We see this all the time with famous people who swallow the bullet or hang themselves or kill themselves with drugs. They have great moments, but the space is bad. Don't let that be you. Fill the space up right. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this pair of talks. And please like, comment, subscribe, and share these talks and all my other work. I will greatly appreciate that. I'm trying to build an audience, and I need your help to do that. I can't do it alone. I can only put the content there, and if you don't care to share it, then it'll just die right there. Um, uh, you know, I don't think anybody wants that. Um, anyway, I do appreciate it. I do appreciate you listening, and as always, God bless you.